that I can pay to Franken, I think, is to say that he's the lesser of National Hunt Racing, because the two of them are unique. And I don't know how one begins to even measure genius, but by whatever standard you use, Lester and Franken have got to be out on their own. I must say that since he, I've been here, he's been a pleasure to watch. Um, at times, I wish I could get through a flat race as smoothly as he gets through a jump race. Well, he's a brilliant pilot, really. He gets horses to jump very well, and... Uh, He's very cool, he's a complete jockey, he's a fantastic fellow, really. I am miserable at the thought of national hunt racing without Frankham, which is no disrespect to my many other jockey friends, and there's some very, very fine jockeys riding, but the artistry is apparent to even a gross figure like myself. People have got to like you, and they immediately liked John, and he retaliated. <laughs> yes, we've had, a few, we've had a few excursions together, I used to call him Rattle the Ladder for some time after visits to various hostelries. He, he obviously had uh, uh, tremendous courage because to go on as long as he did, to have as many rides as he had on the firm ground, particularly at the beginning of this season, for instance, um, and have a few falls on that ground too, uh, that showed ter terrific guts. Fred Winter was himself a peerless champion jockey and it was at his stables here at Lambourne in Berkshire that John Frankham first entered racing. He was then a 15-year-old builder's son from Swindon who'd had to abandon an international show jumping career through lack of funds. Frankham obviously came from a different physical mould than Winter and that was to bring its problems. What was to be the most successful jumping story of our time was almost over before it had begun, because Frankham's weight was growing right out of the jockey's frame, and even the usual tricks weren't working. Early on, when I was just getting going, my, my weight had gone up to 11 stone 4, and I was having to take these diuretics, which were like pee pills, before a race. And I remember at Hereford one day walking around, I was riding a horse called Osceola, and I went to walk around the race course beforehand. And I thought I was having a heart attack, and I got this tremendous pain, had to sit down for about five minutes. I sort of got through the race, got down to the side, I felt terrible. I looked out, this was only about my third or fourth ride, and it did actually put me back about six months because the governor watched it on the TV, and obviously thought what a complete weakling it was. The self-denial needed to beat the weight has now brought substantial rewards. And in these last months of the final season, a daily routine far removed from the muck sack and riding out days of the teenage apprentice. I will get up about half past seven in the morning and walk the dog down the road, down to the village for the papers. There's a purpose behind me walking, you know, it's to keep my weight down. And walking's one of the best forms of exercise I find for me to keep my weight down 
or to keep the fat off of me. So, you know, there is a point to that. Um, and obviously, I, you know, I, I go in in school whenever I'm wanted. I'd probably go in once or twice a week. The confident words of a proven champion. But in the beginning, any ride was a treat. My parents lived in Cardiff, and when we used to go down there on the holiday, we always took the children to Barry Island. And um, John never wanted to go on the fun fair. The girls did, but he never did. And we'd be on the beach, and this particular day, when we first realised that he was so keen, he rode on the ponies, and I think it cost us, what was it, sixpence a time in those days, and which was quite a lot of money. And he rode on them all day long. He, he just didn't get off. And in the end, the man said to me, he said, don't worry about paying me any more, missus. He said he can ride the rest of the day for nothing. And he did. And from then on, he kind of talked about ponies. And he was always keen on seeing ponies. And so in the end, we bought him one. This was when we first went to a gymkhana, which we went to, and at his first event, it was only a little local one, and he came home with the uh, five rows at set of six. And now uh, we thought then that we well, were delighted that he had rosette, but we still didn't realise how good he was until other people used to tell us that one day he's going to be some horseman. I remember him first um, as a very, very good show jumper and uh, he had the best possible ground in where any steeplechase jockey can have and that's, um, he did a lot of show jumping. And my advice, very, very strong advice to anybody who's thinking of becoming a steeplechase jockey is to do as much show jumping as possible. I mean, the, the show jumping boys jump two or three hundred jumps a day and the whole game is about jumping. And John is really good at measuring the stride of a horse into a fence and that's why the show jumpers have to be so good at it. Swindon to St Moritz, those gifts were clear. John was already British Junior show jumping champion and set for the very top. I have to tell him I got that stuff for uh, killing the moss off. All right. Thank you. We'd always managed to pay our way show jumping, and when it came to time to leave school, I'd given no thought as to what I wanted to do. Um, I just knew that if I was going to go show jumping, it was going to mean a lot of expense for my parents, which I didn't want to burden them with. So I just decided to be a jockey, and don't ask me why. I mean, I'd never been interested in racing. Uh, I'd never watched it on the television. And I'd never heard of Fred Winchell. I mean, it was just pure luck that I went to him. It was another year before Frankham's name actually made the race card on a little horse called Multi Grey at Worcester. And that very first ride started the winner's tally. Gosh, I was, I was so thrilled. I couldn't believe. And uh, Norman and the manager rode in about midnight. They, Norman said, well, I can die a happy man now. Well, I was very excited. I took my manager, and um, I can still see him now going round for the first time. And I thought he was the greatest uh, jockey in the world because he won the first race, you know. But uh, of course, on hindsight, we uh, see it, that he had a lot to learn. Well, it was uh, a question of trial and error, really. I mean, uh, every, every horse that I put him on uh, seemed to jump better, than, better for him than anybody else. We all knew that his, his jockeyship wasn't what was uh, required to start off with, and the finishing particularly was very untidy. But uh, his race riding itself wasn't too bad. That improved. But it, the main thing was his his uh, uh, his 
presentation of a horse as an obstacle, and this was exceptional, right from the start, really. So I mean, he obviously had a wonderful eye, and um, I don't think you developed that. I think you're born with that sort of thing. Right, so what's the name? Break the neck? Yeah. That'll do, mate. Frankham certainly made the best use of that inborn talent. Within six years of joining Fred Winter, he had become stable jockey and won his first riding championship. And as he breakfasts here with his wife Miriam and his long-standing friend and rival Steve Smith Eccles in the spring of 85, he has already ridden twice as many winners that season as any of his fellow jockeys, and so he's assured of his seventh National Hunt title. No, my lightest weight is 10 stone 9, but my weight settled down a lot. I mean, I feel very well, and I eat properly. I don't overeat, but I eat properly. And I've just found the balance. I don't let my weight go up in the summer. I've got to go early, so I'll take you if you like. Well, if you don't want to get that early, you could bring John later. I could go on my own. You could bring John on. Yeah, no problem. Right. Why didn't Di come down this weekend? She's busy working on horses, actually. Do uh, you Getting ready for Liverpool. Yeah, yeah great. Is she going to run that over to Yeah, apparently you worked with uh, Tom Jones' Derby horses this morning. It worked really? well. Just finished two lengths behind them. Really? Yeah. 71058. Well, well. Morning, Alan. Never better. W. Fisher. That's it. It's Why? the phone that I think is the worst thing. It yeah, is so yeah. irritating. It's, it's unbelievable okay. when it goes for the 20th time. Um, and the, the trouble is, of course, it, it, you only have those couple of hours between riding out and going racing, and so everybody's trying to get a hold of John, oh, and it is um, so annoying. Anyway, he took his wife off the edge, that's Lady Darby, before she said to Lady Darby, you've got any horses, dear? <laughs> <laughs> you've got any race horses? They've got flags all over them. Yeah, they've got horses. Yeah, they've got flags all over the box. Great. Darby winners. <laughs> I think it's great, isn't it? There's a guy who has generous give it a world. I mean, I always stay yeah, with him uh, in Lambourne when I'm down that area. But on a race course, he wouldn't give you an inch. Which, you know, you wouldn't expect. For all the banter, this lifestyle has clearly needed thought as well as simple race course thrust if the rewards are ever to justify this sport's real dangers. The rewards for a jump jockey, for it's the same as any sport. I think the top ten people earn a good living. Then you go down, and the next thirty are just okay. And then after that, I mean, you're just existing. And that'd be the same for I think most other professional sports. Oh, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Morley, can I speak to David Morley, please? Yeah, it's John Franklin speaking. Thank you. The only thing Morning, with. David. Um, um, being a jump jockey is that you have a lot more added risks. If you're in the lower sort of hundreds as a tennis player, then all right, you might not be making a fortune, but you know you're going to come home safely every night. Whereas jumping, you've always, you, you've always got the risk factor, and it's something that I always think that you've got to be earning a good living at it to warrant taking the risks. They're certainly not comparable with a flat jockey. I mean, if I had been champion jockey on the flat seven times, then I'm sure I would have earned an awful lot more than I have through being a jump jockey seven okay. times. Listen, I'm sorry about that, but we'll stay in touch. OK, bye. Ronnie just turned over these three, then hack along the bottom, and then we can come up again. For Frankham, the actual workshop is the gallops of a morning where the horses, the tools of his trade, are fashioned and schooled for their business over the obstacles. I think the schooling part was the only part of the job that I never ever got fed up with. Um, to get on a young horse that's never jumped anything in its life and pop it over some hurdles for the first time was a great thrill. The reason I found it fascinating was because each horse was different. I mean, say you're on a horse that um, jumps the first hurdle and it doesn't jump it very well. You've got to know straight away why it hasn't jumped it very well. Either it, perhaps it lacks a little bit of confidence and it just wants to go up and down a few more times and pat on the neck, or sometimes it might be leery 
and wants a good crack round the back side, in which case you do it there and then. And it's important that you know your job. I think the main reason we get on, or we've got on and lasted so long together, is the fact that we've kept apart. He's always done his job. I've never tried to tell him how to train the horses. And alternatively, he's never ever said to me, look, you know, I think you ought, or occasionally you say, look, I think you should have done this or done that. <laughs> but I mean, very few times, considering the number of rides I've had for him. And it's been very much a sort of trainer jockey relationship. I, th I think uh, early on I, uh, he did what I said and uh, then over the years it's gradually got to him doing what he wants to do. I, uh, uh, I had my, uh, my own ideas. Um, really, I mean, we, we've worked him very well together. We never had a row at all over that sort of thing. But I mean, but, yeah, over the last four or five years, I just said to Johnny, well, do what you want to do. I just remember him saying to me one day, right. it was the changing point okay. in my career. He said to me, coming home from the gallops one day, you want to remember that this game's a business. And it just did change my attitude an awful lot. I mean, at the end of all the playing, you are out there to win. Okay, And on the way to that business, Frankham's cars have logged up some 600,000 miles on the road to the races. That's 24 times round the world, enough to dull the brightest of minds. And so, not surprisingly, they've got up to some fairly unusual japes. There's always something different to amuse you. I know going up and down the motorway, we went through a stage, we used to moon at old ladies in coaches up and down the M4, which used to amuse us, but not too many other people. But sometimes the trip has left special memories, like an April day at Cheltenham in 78, when John Frankham's name was in the papers because of his association with the flamboyant bookmaker John Banks, but finally was also in the winner's list for the Gold Cup itself, when he rode home on Midnight Court in the most prestigious chase of them all. I think that was the best, best day that I've ever had. And I actually went to the Gold Cup that day, stood next to Miriam, and I think we both stood there with our eyes shut part of the way until we suddenly realised that he was going to win, second fence out, and that was it. Wonderful. They come to the fence at the top of the hill, Fort Devon from Forest King, Royal Frolic, and then a Midnight Court just in behind them on the inside, coming up towards the two fences, Two plain fences in front of the stands to complete the first circuit with Fort Devon and Bill Smith still making it from Royal Frolic, Forest King, Midnight Court, Brown Laird, Ottaway and Master H and Fort Fox and Cancello and Bachelors Hall. And Royal Frolic right up there now at this penultimate ditch with Fort Devon. Royal Frolic from Fort Devon there, Midnight Court on the inside and Fort Fox a faller there. Running downhill now towards the fourth from home in the Piper Champagne Gold Cup, and it's Fort Devon from Royal Frolic, Midnight Court, Cancello and Master H, these five. Little between the leading duo there, Fort Devon and Royal Frolic with Midnight Court and John Frankham just in behind them. They're coming to the home turn with two fences left to jump. And Midnight Court coming there strongly on the inside of Fort Devon. And Royal Frolic to take it up now. And it's John Frankham bidding for compensation for that defeat in the Daily Express Triumph Hurdle. As he comes to the second last to try and win Fred Winter his first Gold Cup. He comes to the second last well clear, jumps it well. It's Midnight Court going away now from Royal Frolic. And Fort Devon then comes Master H and Bachelors Hall coming to the last fence now. And Midnight Court has only got to jump it. He jumps it well and strides away from it to a great roar. Royal Frolic has fallen at the last. 
and as they race up towards the line, Midnight Court going away from the remainder, Brown Lad putting in a tremendous run, so is Bachelors Hall and Master H, but as they come up towards the line, it's Midnight Court where the clearly wins the Piper Champagne Gold Cup, Midnight Court wins it. I it's think it's very difficult to pick out individual days. I mean, if, if I had to pick out a day, it would be when John won the Gold Cup, because that was so wonderful, but because that morning the papers had been full of how wicked he was, and, and it was the atmosphere at Cheltenham that day was wonderful. And I think there were an awful lot of people that, that were equally as delighted as I was that, that he'd won. That was probably the bestest day. I think he gives him tremendous confidence. He's, uh, he rides Borough Hill lad superly, and I've never had cause to uh, criticise him when he's ridden for me. He's, he is the master. Of that, there is no doubt. This is the 11th. Wayward lad on the right. And Borough Hill lad, the better jump there. Come down towards the second last ditch, the 12th. Borough Hill lad, Wayward lad, Coombs ditch. Borough Hill lad from Wayward lad. Beautiful jump from Barrow Hill, lad. Absolutely magnificent. Wayward lad gets a reminder, gets another reminder. Got to be kept up to his work. There's five for jump. It's Barrow Hill, lad. Wayward lad and Coombs ditch. They go into the fence together. Marvellous sight, that. Wayward lad on the outside of Barrow Hill, lad. And Coombs ditch back in third. They go to the last on the far side, the fourth from home. And it's Wayward lad and Barrow Hill, lad. And Coombs ditch creeping ever closer. What a race. They've got three more fences to jump. And it looks as if Wayward Lad is in distress and beginning to beat in a retreat. Barrow Hill Lad going on from Coombs Ditch. Can Wayward Lad now, back in third place, find any reserves? It doesn't look as if he can. But it's Coombs Ditch, the challenger to Barrow Hill Lad. And Wayward Lad is out on his feet. They've got three more to jump. And it's Barrow Hill Lad from Coombs Ditch. Barrow Hill Lad on the inside. Coombs Ditch switched to the inside there. They've got two to jump. This is where John Franklin's going to have to ask Barrow Hill Lad to quicken. If it were a handicap, Coombs Ditch would be getting a stern and a half. But it's Burry Hill Lad, Burry Hill Lad from Coombs Ditch, Wayward Lad back in third place, beaten in distress. They've got one more fence to jump. And it's Burry Hill Lad on the right, Coombs Ditch on the left. And there's not that much to choose between the two of them as they come down towards the last. Burry Hill Lad and Coombs Ditch, Burry Hill Lad and Coombs Ditch. How do they meet? They meet it together. Burry Hill Lad on the near side, Coombs Ditch on the far side. Both jockeys going for absolutely everything. Burry Hill Lad and Coombs Ditch, nothing to choose between the two. Burry Hill Lad sticking his neck out, but so too is Coombs Ditch. They're locked in combat up the line. Barrow Hill, Lad and Coombs Ditch have gone past the post absolutely together. Frankham's power is... just got the verdict. Two years earlier, John had been on Wayward Land and again had had to dig deep for victory. And it's Silver Buck in the lead from Little Owl. $50 more going very well in between these two. Then Wayward Lad coming down to the third from home. Silver Buck from $50 more. Little Owl looks beaten three out. Silver Buck from $50 more. Then Wayward Lad and Little Owl coming down to the second from home in this a King George VI chase. And Silver Buck being challenged by $50 more. And Wayward Lad, Silver Buck, $50 more. Wayward Lad, just one more fence to jump. And the Dickinson pair with Silver Buck and Wayward Lad being challenged by $50 more. Vader is the choice between the three. Wayward Lad on the near side. Silver Buck on the far side, $50 more in between these two as they jump the final fence. They're in the air together, they touch down together. $50 more, Wayward Lad and Silver Buck. And it's Wayward Lad on the near side, $50 more fighting back. Wayward Lad from $50 more and Silver Buck. Wayward Lad, $50 more, Silver Buck. Wayward Lad wins it from $50 more in second place. Then came Silver Buck in third. And these that well was in 1982. John Frankham only rode Wayward Lad once again at Liverpool three years later when the horse seemed to have left the glory days far behind. Tom's little owl. Goes out over the far side, well clear of Earl's break. He's got a commanding advantage over half three, who's followed by Wayward Lad, Royal Bond, and Coombs Ditch. Very similar order throughout. Another ditch. He's a brilliant jockey. One of the instances that I recognized uh, recently was his ride on Wayward Lad at Liverpool, where I thought uh, he did everything that a, a champion could do. The pace was far too fast. He let the horse drop in miles out. Um, he went over every jump smooth as silk, and you know, he timed his challenge perfectly. Earl's break on his inside now. Then this considerable gap Nothing gives you more pleasure than to drop a horse out in a race or 
be a long way behind in a race because you think everybody else is going too fast and then you just come through and they're all dying and you're going past them. Um, that's a great feeling, nipping up somebody's inside or getting a few lengths round a bend. Um, again, you know, that's, a, you know, that's all the enjoyment of racing. Tom Siddalow getting back into the picture, wayward lad over the far side, and old man Rolf Bond coming into the picture too, as they come down now towards the second last. Earl's Brig being pressed by half free, wayward lad on the far side, Rolf Bond right up with them, and they're racing now towards the last in a wide open race. Wayward lad over on the far side, half free on the near side, Earl's Brig, then Rolf Bond. On the far side is Wayward Lad, on the near side it's Half Free. Wayward Lad landing in the lead then from Half Free and Earl's Brig. They're racing into the closing stages. It's Wayward Lad from Half Free. Wayward Lad from Half Free and Earl's Brig as they race up towards the line. Wayward Lad is going to win the Whitbread Gold Label Cup chase as they come to the line. Wayward Lad is the winner. Second is Earl's Brig. Third, Half Free. And fourth. And even though John Franken's name will never go down as having ridden a Grand National win. He has put up a performance over the Aintree fences on Uncle Bing in the 1981 Topham Trophy, which, for its forward, balanced horsemanship, few will ever forget. But it's Uncle Bing over on the far side with Sweet September, Monty Python and Clearello, then comes Belly Cross, Never Rock and Flitgrove just in behind them, and then Bien Fay at the chair now. Clearello, Uncle Bing and Sweet September land together from Belly Cross, and Never Rock has gone there. And Uncle Bing on the inside, disputing the lead with Belly Cross, Sweet September, Clearello, Flitgrove on the outside, Monty Python's right up with them too as they jump the next, and Belly Cross touchdown just in the lead. But as they go to the next, it's Uncle Bing disputing the lead with Sweet September and Bally Cross, and let's join Julian Wilson. Sweet September, Bally Cross on the outside, Uncle Bing on the inside. Taro made a bad mistake there, but recovered from it. John Franklin taking the shortest way as usual with Uncle Bing on the inside. The other two leaders over it with Bally Cross on the outside, and Clearella's a faller there. Then uh, on the inside is W Royal as they come to Beechers. And over it, Uncle Bing, Sweet September, and Bally Cross all over. Uh, Monty Python was a faller there. As the leaders run down to the canal turn, with Sweet September on the inside now and Uncle Bing on the outside. As they jump in together, Uncle Bing's the better jumper. We're coming to the last ditch, the fourth from home. It's Uncle Bing going well in the lead from Gilladaka. Then W Royal is in third place, jumped into second. And as they come to the third last, it's Uncle Bing chased now by W Royal. W Royal took it second. As they come down to the second last fence now in the top of them. It's Uncle Bing from W Royal, Bally Cross and Gilladaka, and these are clear of Sweet September at the second last now. Uncle Bing lands in the lead on the inside from W Royal second. A mistake there by Bally Cross. They're coming down to the final fence now, and it's John Frankham who's made just about all the running so far on the top weight. And Uncle Bing in the lead from W Royal. Then comes Bally Cross and Gilladaka under pressure at the final fence, and Uncle Bing lands in the lead from W Royal. There's not much between the two. 200 yards to run. Uncle Bing from Doubly Royal. Uncle Bing is holding Doubly Royal. The top weight is going to win it at the line. Uncle Bing and John Frankham win the top and trophy. Doubly Royal is second and Valley Cross is third. For many people, though, there is one ride etched sharpest in the memory. The day Frankham, replacing the injured John Joe O'Neill, rode Sea Pigeon to win the champion hurdle at Cheltenham. One race will stand out in, in my memory as long as I live and that is Sea Pigeon and his champion hurdle. One felt so sorry for John Joe, of course, being injured and couldn't let it. But I will never forget Frank I and mean, how he had the gall to sit and wait as he did until halfway up the hill before asking him to go. I'll never, ever forget it. Was, it was a masterstroke. That's Sea Pigeon and John Frankham. I was just meant to win that champion hurdle. I mean, I remember thinking early on, I got behind a horse and I thought, shall I go to, the, to his left or shall I go to his right? And this was a horse that had to be, you know, I was on a horse that had to be held up at the back of the field. And it's one of those things, for no reason, I thought, well, I'd just go to his right. And the horse fell. Yeah, there, and Ivan King has gone to the first. Ivan King, a faller at the first. The horse is if I'd just gone the other way, I'd have been brought down. Coming down. That was Frankham, as I love to remember him. Superb. Well, what a fantastic uh, winning run this by John Frankham, who rode the old horse with such tender confidence. Let's see how he won it with Richard Pittman. Despite all those memories and the trappings of success, Frankham hasn't got this far without a very definite rationale. 
I enjoy myself most of the day, but even on the way to the races, I might be laughing and joking, but when I'm not, I'm usually sort of thinking about what I'm going to ride in the afternoon and how I'm going to ride it and sort of how the race might run. Uh, but once um, I've sort of done what I call my part of the job, so that I have actually given some thought to what I'm going to do, then I basically enjoy myself. He also is a real character and a joker. You'd be, a, a number of times we all shared lifts, we were great friends. And uh, I remember once reading the Sporting Life in the back of the car and suddenly it's a light. Johnny decides to set, set light to your, your Sporting Life you're reading. There's never a dull moment in those days. I was saying to Miriam the other day, uh, we'd been somewhere for the weekend and stayed with some people and they'd been all over the world and they were talking about trekking in Tibet and the different cultures in uh, Bolivia and one thing or another and I came out and I said it's, you know, I was ashamed to say that when I go racing I mean we talk about sex in horses and nothing else I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a pretty narrow outlook on life Hi Laura Oh, John, okay. Oh, it's, oh, it's okay. Listen, in what is it? High high in the third race doesn't run. One thing that I've noticed about um, John is his concern for his um, fellow riders. For instance, um, if ever he's walking out of the rain room to go home and there's a jockey sitting on the bench with his head in his hands, probably had a nasty fall, or a jockey who comes walking through from the ambulance room and uh, he looks pretty bad. John will stop, make sure he's all right, on a cup of tea, you've got somebody to drive you home. What is the reason? Um, Graham's too soft. Yeah. It's definitely an on run. Train mistakes. Okay. Yeah. I'm not just talking about the top jockeys, I'm also talking probably a, a, a lad he's never seen in his life. He could have a fall and he could be sitting or lying on, on a bench looking poorly and John would go up and make sure he's all right. Yeah. Is mine ready the first? I mean, I love enjoying myself. I like having a laugh going to the races, um, a laugh and joke in the weighing room, and as soon as I go into the paddock, I think it's good that a jockey should put the owner and trainer at ease. It's no good you going up there and you're fidgeting around nervous in case, you know, wondering what's going to go on. Um, I like to walk in, shake hands with the owner, say hello, how are you, and sort of say something about the horse, might make some stupid comment. And... Uh, I think it's good, I mean that's part of the job, is putting people at ease. You can laugh and joke right up until the time the flag goes up. That's when you've got to start actually behaving yourself. He's a crafty old fox, old Frank. He, um, he always tries to pinch the inside base, third or fourth. And, you know, you, you've got to be tough with him to try and hustle him out of that. Otherwise, I mean, he just naturally assumes it's his spot. So. You, you can't give him an inch because he won't give you one, not out there on the course. I always hate being in the middle of a bunch. I like to be either on the inside or on the outside for the simple reason that if you're on the inside, um, you've only got one horse to contend with. You know, and people do know that if they go to go up the inside, they've got to have about three stone up their sleeve and do it bloody quickly. Otherwise, <laughs> You know, the chances of them actually getting inside the wing to jump the air at the fence are pretty remote. I've never seen another man in my lifetime present a horse to a fence so perfectly so many times. Most jockeys correct their horses three strides from a fence. John does it the moment he lands at the previous fence, he sets his horse up. And there's no panic stations when the horse gets there it knows from its rider, from Jay Franken, what is required. Nine times out of ten, it doesn't. Well, the most important thing about jumping is you get them to enjoy it. It doesn't matter um, what horse it is or what type of horse it is, it must enjoy the jumping. 
and that's where seeing a stride comes into it. You see some of these jockeys that um, ride and they think they've seen a stride and they get a horse, they give it a kick and get it really running and it gets to the fence and it's wrong and it finds it's awkward and sort of pulls its back and gets a pull in the mouth and one thing or another. It's not going to enjoy the jump and it'll worry about it. It's a combination of everything. It's a combination of you getting a feel from a horse. Um, you get a feeling. When a horse sees a fence, I don't know what it is, something happens and you get a feeling come up through its body, through your legs, which goes, but it comes through the rain, ends up in your brain to tell you that that horse has actually seen the fence and it's anticipating jumping. And when you don't get that feeling, I'd say it's not very nice. <laughs> because the only one thing that happens is that you end up on the floor. Um, so it's a combination of that feeling, and then you have to judge the speed with which you're travelling at, um, and try and get the horse to... Ideally it wants to be taken off about three feet in front of the fence or hurdle. When you hear him talk like that, you realise that one of the most basic stimuli for Frankham is that he's a perfectionist. He wants the satisfaction of doing it best. And that means, as a steeplechase jockey, treating half a ton of galloping racehorse almost as if together they know how to fly. But if Frankham is the best ever person at a fence, and even if his percentage of falls is 30% lower than the average, he's still not Superman. And every now and then the ground has come up to eat him, as with Golden Rapper, when in the lead going to Beaches itself. Bad in the centre of the course, Golden Rapper right underneath the stand's rails as they jump that one. Golden Rapper from Churchtown Boy, the dipper towards the centre, then comes Spitting Image towards the wide outside, tracked by Brown Fetcher on Eye Catcher, then comes Red Rum. Just behind these leaders comes uh, the Dickler and Cole Namora, then Sandwell and his prominent and Spanish steps on the inside as they come towards Beaches, and it's Golden Rapper who's going to jump it in front. Golden Rapper from Spanish Steps, and Golden Rapper is gone. I don't remember too much about that because I was concussed, but I do remember him taking off and then just he jumped the fence perfectly well and just never put his front legs out to save himself. And the first thing that's hitting the ground is his nose. And it's always a wonder he didn't break his neck, and mine as well for that matter. I think most of the falls that I've had over the years, um, I could put down to, to being indecisive, actually not having made my mind up. And always it's, it nearly always happens at the, in the second half of a race where you just get into a rhythm. You know that one good jump is the difference between landing, running with the few horses around you that are going well, and being able to take a breather. If you don't jump it well and you're just getting close, you've got a little bit more ground to make up and everything's that much more difficult for the horse. And I, I would think that's where the majority of my falls have come. Frankham's self-criticism about his jumping method 
seems a trifle harsh, but there's much more truth in tough comments on his finishing technique, which in the early days had a lot of improvement to find. If you look back at his early career, how he used to ride, he was very, very weak. But you look at him now, he's about the strongest jockey riding. And it's only been through dedication and hard work himself he's got there. I was always conscious all the time I was riding, even when I'd been champion jockey six times, I was still very conscious of the finish. I mean, I was very weak early on. I don't know whether that just came from the wasting part um, or whether it just wasn't natural for me to um, look like a jockey in a finish. I'd always been show jumping and where it was natural to sit on your backside when you wanted to make a horse go faster. But I was, it was something I was always conscious of and worked hard at. And I never felt that I was ever better than very good, if you like, for the finish. But it's Barry Hill Lad, Barry Hill Lad from Coombs Ditch, Wayward Lad back in third place, people in distress. They've got one more fence to jump. And it's Barry Hill Lad on the right, Coombs Ditch on the left. And there's not that much to choose between the two of them as they come down towards the last. Barry Hill Lad and Coombs Ditch, Barry Hill Lad and Coombs Ditch. How do they meet it? They meet it together. Barry Hill Lad on the near side, Coombs Ditch on the far side. Both jockeys going for absolutely everything. Barry Hill Lad and Coombs Ditch, nothing to choose between the two. Barry Hill Lad sticking his neck out, but so too is Coombs Ditch. Well, that finish to get Borough Hill Lad past Coombs Ditch in the 1984 King George might be rated rather better than very good by many observers. But how does Frankham see the life he is leaving, the heady days when he is king amongst his own? I think I'm as good as anybody now. And I think just over the years, I've just been very consistent. I've, I've seen a lot of jockeys come and go since I've been riding. And I've just kept at it and been more consistent than anybody else. I think that's the only difference. Yeah, the weighing room to me, the greatest place on the race course and it's the only part of the race that I think I'll miss when I pack up riding. I can't imagine that I've missed the riding very much because I've done because I've done so much over the years, but I will miss having a laugh with the lads in the weighing room. A tremendous atmosphere. The only thing that's changed is that now I wear an all-round body protector made of polystyrene. These give you protection all the way around your ribs, over your shoulders and the lower part of your back. If I don't get remembered for anything else in racing, yeah. I'd like to be remembered for having introduced that. <laughs> they keep sort of kick lads going in the way and we've always got jokes and always, you know, he's great fun to go racing with. He's, He's a confident sort of bloke. When you're with him, he gives you confidence. I mean, he, you know, in one respect, he doesn't sort of care about anything. But on the other hand, you know, he gets out there and does the business. He doesn't get that down, if you know what I mean. Uh, he sort of carries everything off with his joking sort of manner. He's got an amazing charisma. Charisma. I mean, the weighing room when he's riding basically revolves around John Franklin, and it's going to be a great loss in the weighing room for him not to be there. But for all the good he has done and the memories he has left, Franklin's lifestyle has not been to everybody's taste. I don't think his image as a, a champion jockey is right, but that's the way he wants it. And as I said to my wife, as long as Miriam, his wife, is happy, that's all that matters. And as long as he provides the, the winners that I want, that again is all that matters. But I don't approve. I don't think jockeys dress as well as they ought to today. And um, I think this long hair is an absolute rot. Well, there's no doubt that in 10 years' time, probably people would have forgotten what I was like as a jockey. And uh, I will be remembered as the uh, jockey who was associated with a bookmaker. That bookmaker was the flamboyant John Banks. And with newspapers implying that the pair had committed just about every sin in the racing book, 
Frankham's future was under the blackest of clouds and Fred Winter's support clearly saved the day. There was a point there where I definitely thought I was going to lose my job. But it was only for just for about two seconds when we came out of the interview room at Cheltenham after I'd been interviewed by the race course security for the first time. And he has this amazing look on his face when he's very, very cross and it's like thunder and his eyes disappear. I looked at him and I thought, well, God, you're going to have to say something. And so I said, which is quite truthfully, look, despite what's gone on in there, I've never ever said anything to John, which I wouldn't say in front of you or any of the owners. And he thought for a second and he just said, if I thought that, you wouldn't be standing there and walked off. And we never discussed it. And never another word spoken about the whole thing. Winter's loyalty did no harm. John Banks being outlawed for three years, Frankham's suspension being confined to just six weeks that summer. But even if bookmaker associations did not rise up officially again, trouble about Frankham's style of riding and his attitude to the authorities clearly remained. Indeed, at one stage, he was setting new records in this area too. Yeah, I think most of the um, problems after the John Banks inquiry, I was something that was, you know, I mean, they watched me like a hawk. And... A lot of the trouble ca came from the the way I ride. I mean, I've, ac I've actually got a quiet style of riding. I don't know, I think they just got obsessed with me for some reason. So the most successful jumping career of all time also had its share of controversy. But how much did the emotions get involved with the horses that were doing the work? I think the answer is not at all. They are basically business partners. I, mean, I might ride a horse out for an hour in the morning, once in a fortnight or school it once or twice you don't see enough of them to get close to them you ride them and as i said they are part of your business and you can't afford to get attached to them and i didn't often sort of it was my idea to ride each one with the view that if it could speak when i got off of it it would say you know what well, you did a good job or you know i wouldn't mind you riding me again i hated to see horses abused the voice, as so often, is that of the craftsman who appreciates respect rather than adulation of his work. But while many of us will remember him as the man who took his own craft, something precious close to an art form, the fact is that J. Frankham, the jockey, is no longer in service. And so the final question has to be, will there be life out of the saddle? Can his new career as a trainer bring anything like the same success? If I've done anything, I've always wanted to do it properly. And I should give it my full attention. I should give it three or four years. And if I find that I'm no good at it, I should pack up and do something else. Go on. But we're here to pay him tribute. Let's give you the seven times champion jockey, the Piper Champagne, Champagne Jockey of the Year, the record-breaking John Franklin. Well, now that I've retired, Miriam said that I'm to grow up, finally, and to stop making funny remarks about these lemon squeezers. I just tell a little joke instead. It's, it's very relevant, but it's quite sad. It was when the Eiffel Tower caught on fire, and it had been going for an hour, and it was well ablaze. And they looked up right at the top and there was Quasimodo and they said, Christ, poor old Quasi, they'd forgotten all about him. And uh, After anyway, all the awards, it's the new beginning. And all that one can guarantee is that the training profession's new recruit will come equipped with resources of the most unusual depth and a certain style. And he's, they're all shouting, jump with the blankets. He's going, oh, pointing to his back. So the daughter arrives, they say, what's he saying? She said, it's easy, saying, what do you think this is on my back, a <laughs> parachute? <laughs> Bye.
But for all the character, cheekiness, even controversy of the man, he was something special, something that comes just once in a lifetime.